I'd like to welcome everybody and thank you for all coming down. Uh, we're, we're here, despite a very loud uh, mic check of another, another nature, uh, to celebrate the passage of the 2012 On to Ottawa Trekkers through Regina. I just wanted to speak briefly to the history of the On to Ottawa Trek. Uh, and sort of frame it against what these guys are doing, because they're, they're brave, they're, they're so brave, they're heroes to us all. But first, I'd like to tell a, a, a quick parable, I want to make sure everybody's familiar with this one. Uh, the parable of the frog. Uh, it, it is said that if, if you want to cook a frog, if you take a pot of boiling water and throw a frog in it, he'll jump out, because he's hot! However, you put that same frog into a pot of water and Pan slowly heat it to a, a boil, bit and you'll get really good frog. I know that's what I was doing. Cause showing the crowd. I think, I think that's a pretty good parable for a lot of the conditions that we're okay. in, and uh, we'll, we'll see how that plays through this story here a little bit as well. In the severe economic depression of the 1929 to 1939, Canadian labor engaged in many fierce battles. One of the highlights was the general strike of young unemployed single men in work camps in the province of BC on Canada's west coast in April 1935. There they labored six and a half days a week for the paltry wage of 20 cents a day. The strikers abandoned the camps and congregated in the city of Vancouver. After two months of valiant but unsuccessful struggle for union wages, they decided to take their case direct to Ottawa, the nation's capital, 3,000 miles to the east. Their journey was enshrined in history as the On to Ottawa Trek. They left Vancouver on June 3rd, riding the rod on and in railway freight, car, uh, railway freight cars. Across mountains and prairie, they reached Regina, still only halfway to Ottawa. Right here, just a little ways over that way, over my right shoulder, uh, they were stopped by the RCMP on orders from Ottawa, and a month later, the strike was brutally smashed on July 1st. Sorry, that, that was the event that was just over my right shoulder, in a police-inspired riot, and its leaders were arrested. Their epic strike and trip captured the hearts and minds of Canadians. While the strike was suppressed, it wasn't lost. In the federal election a few months later, the hated, repressive, conservative government of Prime Minister R.B. Ironheel Bennett went down to resounding defeat. Yeah. The new Liberal government felt compelled Get to close. abolish the camps. Down. Uh, the isolation and dehumanizing conditions of the camps created an ideal situation for organizing. Workers were desperate and they had the time and contact to figure out how to take action. Relief camp workers in BC formed the Relief Camp Workers Union under the direction of Arthur Evans, a skilled carpenter, miner, and communist labor organizer. Uh, the RCWU demand for work and wages spread quickly through the camps. Through 1934, the RCWU grew into a strong, disciplined, democratic organization, focusing the hopes and energy of the unemployed. The inmates called them slave camps. In these camps, men were issued war surplus clothing, given a bunk in a tar paper shack, fed armor, army rations, and forced to work six and a half days a week for 20 cents a day. Uh, the, the economic background on this, uh, from 1929 to 39, Canada suffered the longest and deepest economic depression in its history, until possibly the, the recent bailout of the Canadian banks uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, the economic crisis was ushered in by the Wall Street market crash of 20, 1929. Uh, these people organized uh, and pushed for union workers' rights. Uh, this uh, culminated in a general strike that they had called on May 1st of that year. Uh, in a similar fashion, the Onda Ottawa Trekkers and the Occupy, uh, the Occupy Canada movement called for a general strike on May 1st. This is wondering how the, um, and that is also when our Trekkers embarked on their, uh, their trek yeah, across Canada. I'm just wondering how the volume is doing. Um, skipping over a little bit because we're uh, a little drowned out. However, we're, we're jumping ahead in the story to Swift Current. Uh, oh, even past that, sorry. Uh, on June 13th, the Trekkers arrived in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, where they were greeted by a large body of citizens and provided with meals in restaurants by the authorities. Uh, they stayed over and held a public 
public meeting that addressed uh, that evening, addressed by Emmons and other Trek leaders as well as local citizens. Uh, the next and last stop, as it turned out, was right here in Regina, Saskatchewan, the capital city of the province, where they arrived on June 14. They were joined here by 500 more men from the Dundurn Relief Camp, which put their numbers somewhere around 2,000. Uh, Prime Minister Bennett ordered the police to hold the trek at Regina. This was done over the protests of provincial premier James Gardner, who legally was in charge of the RCMP in the province. The police were ordered to prepare to use revolvers, gas grenades, spare batons, and handcuffs. Railway police were ordered to cooperate with the RCMP. Orders were given to bar all exits in and out of Regina. Hundreds of RCMP from other provinces were shifted here as well. The city was placed under police siege. The commissioner of the RCMP in Saskatchewan later boasted to a royal commission investigating the Regina events that he had considerable experience with demonstrations and strikes and the use of force against rioters. Uh, Hugh Guthrie, the Federal Minister of Justice, charged in the House of Commons in Ottawa that the Trekkers were a distinct menace to the peace, order, and good government of Canada. Evans and a delegation of strikers, meanwhile, met several times with Premier Gardner, whose main concern was to get the Trekkers out of his province before any serious trouble developed. The public was solidly on the side of the Trekkers. Over 6,000 citizens in this small city gave the Trekkers an enthusiastic welcome at a public meeting on June 14th. The speakers included the National Secretary of the CCF, Church and Trade Union leaders, and Evans. The meeting by resolution demanded that the marchers be allowed to proceed on their way to their goal. A tag day here for the Trekkers raised over $1,400. The Trekkers Strike Committee decided that they would defy the ban and continue on to Ottawa on June 17th. Uh, by the time the Trekkers reached Regina, Bennett had already decided it was time to put an end to this insurrection. The CPR was ordered to ban the Trekkers as trespassers. The federal cabinet directed the RCMP to bolster troops in Regina to disperse the Trekkers. Meanwhile, the Trekkers met with government ministers in Regina who proposed that a small delegation continue to Ottawa. A public meeting of the Trekkers voted to send eight members to Ottawa, including Arthur Evans. This delegation met with Bennett on June 22nd. Bennett called the strike a revolution whose purpose was to destroy law and order. Evans presented the strikers' demands, but the meeting disintegrated into heated exchanges with Bennett calling Evans a thief and Evans calling Bennett a liar. Negotiations ended. Returning to Regina, the strikers' delegation was met by the entire body of the trekkers. Evans reported briefly to the men, and again that night to a public meeting of 7,000 people. They came back to find that Prime Minister Bennett had broken his solemn agreement that the men would be given three meals a day until the delegation returned. Uh, many of those meals actually were uh, provided to the Trekkers in that building right there. The right-hand storefront in that building used to house the Novia Cafe very proudly from back in this time up until just recently. Uh, it closed in the last couple of years. Much. Uh, much to uh, my disappointment. Woo! <laughs> uh, the meals had been cut off before they returned. The federal government, in the meantime, had used the absence of the strike leaders to set up a special camp, which the RCMP commissioner, commissioner termed a concentration camp, in Dundurn, Saskatchewan, in preparation for the arrest of the Trekkers' leaders and the imprisonment of all the men involved. The Trekkers now began to realize that it was getting a little bit warm in that pot. Uh -huh. They realized they couldn't get out of Regina by truck or rail. All exits were blocked. A final test, or a test run by the Trekkers and their supporters using trucks had resulted in the arrest of the occupants and the confiscation of the vehicles. They had run out of funds for meals. The mood was one of anxiety. Assistant Commissioner Wood of the RCMP warned the citizens of Regina that anyone assisting the Trekkers in any attempt to leave Regina would be liable to arrest. Ashes. On June 28th, in a press statement, he warned that anyone who assisted the strikers with food, shelter, or transportation would be charged under an order in council just passed by Ottawa under the Relief Act. And as it turned out later, no such order in council had ever been passed. Uh, the trekkers uh, made clear, time and again, that under no circumstances would they accede to the demand of the government that they disband and voluntarily agree to go into a concentration camp in nearby Dundurn. They recognized that they faced an impasse and realized that soon force would be used against them to smash the trek. 
Evidence later made public confirmed that the RCMP had already made extensive plans to arrest the Trek leaders and smash the Trek by force. In an effort to avoid any trouble, the Trekkers now made a major compromise. They agreed to call off their Trek, provided the government send them back to Vancouver in a body, and from there, to the relief camps from which they had come. The Trekkers also asked assurance that there would be no arrests. On July 1st, Evans and other Trek leaders spent the whole day meeting with the head of the RCMP, a representative of the federal government, and the Premier of Saskatchewan. The meetings got nowhere. The head of the RCMP told them that if they refused to go to the special camp prepared for them, they would have to face the consequences. The Trekkers and citizen support groups had decided to call a public meeting on the Market Square on the evening of July 1st, then labeled Dominion Day, to bring the public up to date on what had happened so far. The meeting began at 8 p.m. Three large vans were parked on three sides of the square, concealing RCMP riot squads. A whistle was blown and out charged RCMP. City police did likewise, having also been concealed in a nearby garage. The police began indiscriminately clubbing everyone within reach. The attack caught everyone by surprise, but then anger took over. People grabbed anything available to fight back, stones, sticks, and anything else lying around. Then RCMP on horseback also charged into the crowd with their clubs. Driven from the square, the battle continued in the surrounding streets for four hours. Evans and the other trekkers on the speaker's platform uh, were arrested by a body of police in plain clothes. The police began firing their revolvers above and into groups of people. Tear gas bombs were thrown at any groups that gathered together. In the course of the battle, plate glass windows in stores and offices were smashed. However, with a single exception, there was no looting. Some trekkers and their citizen supporters covered their faces with wet handkerchiefs to counter the effects of the tear gas. They barricaded streets with cars. Finally, the trekkers who had attended the meeting made their way individually or in small groups back to the stadium where they were quartered. When it was over, 120 trekkers and citizens had been arrested and one plainclothes policeman killed. Hundreds of local citizens and trekkers who had been wounded by police gunfire or otherwise injured were taken to hospitals or private homes. Those taken to hospital were also arrested. Police claimed 39 injuries in addition to the one in plain clothes who had been killed. The stadium was surrounded by constables armed with revolvers and machine guns. Next day, a barbed wire stockade was erected around the stadium. The trekkers in the stadium were denied food or water. Uh, news of the police inspired by a front of the About midnight, one of the Trek leaders telephoned Premier Gardner, who agreed to meet their delegation, led by Mike McCauley, the next morning. The RCMP were livid when they heard this. They took the men to the police station for interrogation, but finally released them so they could see the Premier. Premier Gardner sent a wire to Prime Minister Bennett, accusing the police of pre precipitating a riot while he had been negotiating a settlement with the Trekkers. He also told the Prime Minister the men should be fed where they are and sent back to camp and homes as they request. He stated his government was prepared to undertake this work of disbanding the men. An agreement to this effect was subsequently negotiated. Uh, Prime Minister Bennett was satisfied that he had smashed the trek and taught the citizens of Regina a dirty lesson. Gardner was happy that he was getting rid of the strikers from Regina and the province. The Federal Minister of Justice made the false statement in the House of Commons on July 2nd that shots were fired by the strikers and the fire was replied to with shots from the city police. During the long course of the trials that followed, no evidence was ever produced by the Crown that strikers had ever fired any shots. Prime Minister Bennett further added, added to the misrepresentation by stating in the House of Commons the same day that the trek was not a mere uprising against law and order, but a definite revolutionary effort on the part of a group of men to usurp authority and destroy government. Little did they know what, what the political repercussions of their forcible suppression of a protest movement against the camps would be. The trek was disbanded following the terms of agreement that the strikers negotiated earlier with the province. A federal inquiry found the tragic events of Dominion Day in 1935 were caused by revolutionaries not instigated by the RCMP. The people of Canada threw out Bennett's Conservatives in the next year's general election. Uh, the relief camps were shut down and the seeds were sown for a new welfare system, including unemployment insurance. Many Trekkers, radicalized by the Depression, fought, uh, volunteered to fight in the Spanish Civil War. Others stayed in Canada to fight for progressive causes such as union rights, unemployment insurance, social welfare, and Medicare, until the fight with the fascists in Europe called them to war.
this community uh, that was capable of resistance, that was capable of single action on, on the behalf of the collective. I, I sincerely believe that that was the biggest fear in Western governments about the Occupy. Uh, one month in, we were already turning into a very effective group of organizers. And I think that there was a lot, a great deal of fear involved in that. Um, also, a lot of times, I think we are, we are the pot, or we are the frog in the pot. Uh, the, the conditions of capitalism, at the start of the game, at the start of Monopoly, everybody's happy. Everybody's got the same stack of $1,500 to go around the board with. We've been playing this game for way too many years, and we're tired of the one guy left that's got all the properties and all the money making deals with us to take just a little more of our freedom to go around the board one more time.